Okay. Hello, all. Um, welcome to our Chicago edition of the Black and Indigenous People of Color and Medicine series. I'm going to give us a few more minutes while folks log in, um, and then we'll get started. Okay, so again, welcome everyone. Um, we are excited to have this program for the next hour. Um, I'd like to start off by just introducing myself. I'm Dr. Jackson Johnson. Um, I'm an OB attending here in Chicago with Erie Family Health Centers um, and on staff at Northwestern Medicine. Um, and this evening, I'll be your moderator along with some of help from the rest of our panel. Um, essentially, this series is a joint effort between the University of Illinois' Urban Health Program and the Twerk for Diversity in Medicine. Um, and this evening, we're going to be discussing the path to healthcare. Um, in particular, how can you all become strong applicants um, as you go throughout your journey? So, we have a fantastic group of panelists here this evening representing medicine dentistry, pharmacy, as well as admissions. Um, and throughout the discussion, we certainly welcome any questions that you may have throughout the Q&A function, through the Q&A function. Um, first, to start, I'd like to give our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves. So I'd like to start with Dr. Thompson. Good evening, my name is Trevon Thompson. I am the Dean for Admissions at the University of Illinois College of Medicine. I'm also an emergency physician and medical toxicologist at the University of Illinois Hospital and Health Sciences System. Thank you. Uh, next up, we'll go to Dr. Trevino. Hey guys, I am currently a third year pediatrics resident at the Medical College of Wisconsin, but I did my MD PhD training at Rush uh, in Chicago. And I apologize for the number of times that you will hear a screaming one-year-old in the background. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Torres? Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Xavier Torres. I'm a pharmacy operations manager at the University of Chicago. I did my pharmacy training at uh, UIC. Thank you. Dr. Jones? All right. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Angel Jones. As stated before, I am a dentist here in Chicago, practicing in my private practice in downtown Chicago, also at a public health facility, Londo Christian Health Center. Awesome. And lastly, Ms. Meadows. Good evening, everyone. My name is Pamela Meadows. I work within the College of Medicine at the University of Illinois Chicago College of Medicine in the Department of the Urban Health Program where our mission is to recruit, retain, and graduate those who are underrepresented in the field of medicine. Myself, as well as others here, we do advising, pre-med advising for students so they can be their most competitive selves. So it's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so again, we welcome and encourage you all to ask questions. Um, we'll be answering them throughout the series um, this evening. Uh, but to start, I'd like to- Dr. Dr. Jackson, we have Dr. Gloria Elam, our Associate Dean of Diversity and Inclusion and Director of the Urban Health Program. I believe she's a, she's been at it, Dr. Elam. Um, I wanted to introduce you to the group. Okay, thank you. I can't get my video working, uh, but I just wanted to welcome everyone, all our panelists, uh, for coming back to the university, uh, joining us and helping our students. And Dr. Uh, Matthews, uh, we still miss you. Uh, so we are really pleased with everyone. Thank you for coming and enjoy the evening. 
Thank you, Dr. Elam. So uh, for starters, I'd like for everyone, well, our panelists, um, to kind of go through what, um, what made you apply to your specific field. So whether dentistry or pharmacy or medicine, um, how did you make that decision? Um, and we'll start with Dr. Torres. All right. So I think about what kind of got my uh, juices flowing, I guess, when I came to pharmacy. It had to be, I think, maybe senior year of high school. Um, you know, that the idea of pharmacy just popped into my head, to be honest with you. And it just kind of stuck with me throughout uh, my undergrad and and throughout, um, you know, those those couple of years. You know, but as I got, got more involved, you know, with volunteering um, in different health systems and different opportunities that came up, um, I just... I just kind of just, just got gravitated towards it. I was had a slight inkling to uh, to chemistry and biology, so when I decided to put those two things together and looked at the time horizon that I felt like I wanted to be in school, pharmacy just kind of was that Goldilocks zone for me. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Jones, what made you lean towards dentistry? Uh, it was a childhood dream. <laughs> Really, at about 12 years old, I knew what I wanted to do, going to the dentist every time I was just fascinated. And so I took that dream with me all the way, you know, fed it, researched, you know, um, studied it out and everything just, um, you know, my passion just flew with it as I got older and the more I dug into it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. And Dr. Trevino, why? Why medicine and pediatrics? So, you know, it's funny. I, I shared a story um, similar to a lot of people in terms of, you know, coming from the high school where I was at. Um, not a lot of people who look like me kind of left our state for any sort of education. And so when people were good in math or science, they were directed towards medicine or engineering um, as a whole, but didn't give a lot of insight into what that actually meant. And off to college, I went without a really great sense of what that meant to become a physician. I knew I liked working in the community and I liked being a teacher. And actually prior to medicine, I, I did teach middle school science for a number of years. Um, but ultimately what I realized was medicine was the way that I wanted to continue to work in the community. Um, it gave me a different insight into when I work with schools and in the education, the K through 12 education sector which is really one of the big drivers for me with my interest in pediatrics. Um, and one, the kind of the funny twist in all of this for me was where research came in. Because if you had talked to me prior to medical school about you know, would I pursue a PhD, I would have thought you were crazy. Um, but I've learned over the years to think about research as this stool that has kind of three pegs to it. One being the topic that comes up, um, and having some sort of connection for yourself, two being the mentor, and three being the institutional support around you. And I think for a lot of people who go into STEM and our sciences, and I think for even those on the panel, um, when one of those pieces isn't aligned in the right way that you want it, you kind of have are left with a sour taste in your mouth with research. Um, but I was fortunate that in my PhD training, um, those things all aligned nicely and then found ways to continue that work um, in a different capacity, but still doing research during residency and, and my next stages. Awesome, thank you. Um, speaking of kind of wearing two hats and medicine and research, Dr. Thompson, can you go into what made you lead towards medicine and ultimately um, like administrative work? Yeah, so um, you know, when it comes to medicine, um, I maybe maybe similar to Dr. Jones, I have I have wanted to be a physician since I can remember uh, if, when I was. I don't know, probably as early as I could speak, if you had asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, the answer was a doctor. Where that came from, I have no idea, but it persisted throughout my life. And, um, and, and I think the more I learned about medicine in general, the more that was solidified. But I can't tell you where that initial spark came from. It's just something that has always been there within me. And, um, and I just went with it, so to speak. Um, as it relates to other things that I do, um, so I'm an emergency physician and medical toxicologist. So I take 
take care of all manner of emergencies um, in the emergency department, which um, and to some degree is a stressful job, but it's one where um, I tend to enjoy uh, that level of stress. I think there are certain fields in medicine um, obstetrics and gynecology being another one, um, some others like anesthesia and different types of surgery and the like where there's high pressure and some of us just seem to to thrive in those uh, fields. Um, and that just, that stuck with me as I was going through medical school. Um, similar to uh, Dr. Torres there, um, I love pharmacology as a discipline, but not enough to go into it. But it turns out that I was able to marry that interest and become a medical toxicologist, um, where I get to use a lot of pharmacologic principles as it relates to um, how poisonings may affect the human body. And so that's how I got into those areas. Um, my field of medical toxicology is what got me into research. I have done poisoning research over the years. Um, and then as I've sort of, um, I've always been interested in academics, um, kind of started with teaching, then adding in the research. Uh, and then the more I started to delve into that, the more I realized that um, there are opportunities in higher administration within, um, within medical education. And that's how I transitioned or added, not really a transition, added um, onto the work that I do from an administrative perspective and has ultimately led so far to me being the Dean for Admissions uh, for the University of Illinois College of Medicine. So kind of a, another, you know, tortu or tortuous route to get here, but it's been a great journey um, kind of along the way getting to where I am today. Great, thank you. Thank you for all those answers. And again, we would love to hear your questions so we can answer them as well. So plug into the Q&A function, but in the meantime, um, I'd like to ask Ms. Meadows a question. So as an advisor and someone who's very knowledgeable about this process, of course, um, other panelists have spoken a lot about toxicology, pharmacology, but is focusing on the sciences the way to get yourself into these health professions? Which is important. Um, it's interesting. One of the things when I started venturing more in student advising, and I've been in higher education student advising for over 25 years now. And one of the things I found out when I started to do more pre-med advising is that there are many individuals that are successful physicians, successful healthcare professionals, and they don't particularly love the sciences, some of them, which surprised me at first. But what I learned more was the holistic development and what was key about health professionals that they love the service and they love the combination, the fusion of the sciences and helping individuals in this particular format. And it was confirmed as they start to explore more and more. Now, granted, there are many individuals that love the sciences, but it's not a requirement. So one of the things that is really of intrigue, as well as making the candidate more competitive, is how well-rounded they are. Um, how have they explored their interests and pursued them beyond the requirements, the baseline? Yes, there are prerequisites for every particular field that you're venturing into, but how well do you know yourself? We've actually heard two examples right now. We have Dr. Torres and Dr. Thompson, and Dr. Thompson acknowledged a love for, uh, for pharmacy, and he married that, but not enough. But you found another way to marry that interest. That's perfect. That's exactly what we're looking for. And it's starting that early on, whether it be an undergraduate, whether it be aftergraduate. So seeing that evidence and how they pursue that interest and that love shows how well they know themselves as a learner and therefore how well they know themselves. Um, if I could add to that maybe just a little bit, um, one of my mentors in medical toxicology, for example, was an English major in college, um, and he is now also a, the editor-in-chief for one of our main med medical toxicology journals. And so, and, and he, he's a researcher, he does medical toxicology research as well. But again, it highlights what, um, what Pamela was mentioning, that you can marry these interests in various ways. Um, and another uh, anecdote, one of my current medical toxicology fellows was a professional flautist in Europe for a number of years. Um, and so again, how, do, how, do you be, how are you a musician and then you become a physician? Well, it certainly can happen. Um, and we do look for that well-roundedness um, and you know, having, having passions in all sorts of areas can certainly come into play in, in the field of medicine and how you practice medicine. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. I, Ms. Excuse me, Ms. Meadows. I feel like I, you just described me in college. I was a sociology major, um, women's studies minor. 
um, got through the sciences, but certainly only took what was required. <laughs> and um, it kind of led into a career in women's health, certainly, um, given my interest, but it was more the social aspects of medicine that drew me to the career than necessarily a fundamental deep love of chemistry. Um, wow. So <laughs> um, speaking of another uh, kind of throw back to my college experience. It, for students who may have struggled a little bit early on in their college career um, and, um, you know, maybe didn't excel in that initial general chemistry or uh, general biology course, what recommendations do you have for them as they move through their, um, their academic life and what can they do to kind of still uh, set themselves apart and ultimately get to all whatever health profession career that they desire. And I'm going to go with Dr. Torres. Um, so what I think about that, I, I think about, you know, my time, not only in undergrad, but also in pharmacy school. And, you know, there, there was, you know, there was, I guess, you know, valleys and peaks, you know, of, of performance and whatnot. And I think when I got to I guess those valleys, um, I would say, well, what helped me the most was my sense of personal evaluation and assessment and, and not becoming too hard with myself when things didn't go my way. Um, you know, I realized that I needed to do things differently and that might've meant studying differently. That might've meant, you know, asking for extra help, um, or, or something along those lines. But, um, sometimes we, we think that, you know, we can only learn one way or there's only, um, you know, certain ways to do things. But, you know, through, man, I learned this kind of on the, on the back end of undergrad and destiny at the pharmacy school was that, you know, you have to be flexible. You have to learn yourself. I think part of, you know, a good applicant, right, is to, figure, like, like we spoke on it, learn yourself and figure yourself out. But that's not just um, um, personal passions and things of that nature, but it's also how you work. And, um, you know, for me personally, I think that's kind of allowed me to to kind of get through those those rough times when I didn't you know succeed as much as I wanted to. It really came to you know to a point where I had to you know look in the mirror and say, hey, well, what are you doing that isn't that isn't working? You know, are you do you have distractions in the background? Um, do you have um, different sort of are you are you actually a visual learner or more auditorial learner or something along those lines? But um, it definitely um, it pays to kind of really um, not get down on yourself, but really kind of self-assess. Um, and use all the resources there to you, whether it be YouTube, you know, the internet, and anything else that kind of allows you to to learn learn differently. And, and always reach out at the end of the day. Reach out to those, those that are doing better than you, those that um, your instructors, and 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 be humble and not discouraged about about the, the issues that you might be having. Awesome, thank you. Yes, YouTube was a relatively new phenomenon in college and it was very helpful for some courses. Um, so we do have a few questions coming in to the chat function. And so one in particular um, from Cordero states, um, how, if, how would one handle rejection during the application cycle um, for medical or pharmacy or dental school? And what advice do you have on how to become a successful applicant? Um, I'd like to start with Dr. Trevino. So thank you for being open and honest kind of about probably a situation that you might be in. Um, I think there's a number of people who are on this panel or on this um, participating in this presentation who are in that boat where something hasn't gone the way that they wanted it to. Um, you heard from Dr. Torres, I think a lot of good pieces about how to think about your application and knowing yourself and what that meant for moving things forward. And I think that's equally as important when it comes to dealing with rejection. Um, so I myself, most recently, am, am having to work through not matching into fellowship. And so along with that goes a lot of, you know, taking a step back and handling your emotions about how you may feel um, from having that rejection, but then also circling back and saying, well, where can I go from here? Um, you have to do that check with yourself of, is this the, dire the direction I wanna take? And if it is, then you start thinking about what can you work on? So in my case, I had reached out to programs that I interviewed with and ultimately didn't match to find out any sort of feedback that they had. Um, I took that feedback and met with my mentors to say, hey, what's our plan? Knowing that this is what people felt was a shortcoming for my application, how do I strengthen those areas? But at the same time, not just how do I strengthen the areas for the sake of applying for this next step, 
but how do I strengthen myself and continue to have that professional development for things after this next step? So as I was looking for opportunities in this time between my application cycles, I was giving a very big focus for myself on how do I continue to grow as someone with an interest in academic medicine and make sure that I was still developing other skills even if I wasn't gonna have the same clinical experiences that I might've had in fellowship. And I think the same holds true for someone at the level of applying for a health professions professional school of what else can you do? How can you further move forward your academic interests even if you're not starting school the way that you would want to? Um, but you do have to be open and honest with yourself about what your goals are and what it will take for you to get to that next step. Um, and this is where going, circling back to Dr. Torres again, knowing yourself really comes in play there. Thank you. And I think Dr. Jones wanted to add a little bit to that. Oh yeah, it was actually that first question that Dr. Torres answered, I'm sorry. I didn't wanna make it go long, but I believe the question was about um, what if you're not a strong applicant? And I was all of the not strong applicant. <laughs> um, I was married, had a child, eight month old child at the time. And it was crazy, crazy. Um, and so I think what you do is just, you know, build on what you have. Um, whatever you have, you take it and you, and you build on it. Um, get the help that you need. Um, I believe like when I was um, in started dental school, um, what they wanted to see was maturity. And a lot of times I wasn't mature. I shy away from things and I didn't communicate with the teachers, the instructors. I didn't do what like Dr. Torres says, ask for help and things like that. So um, I think a lot of times we try to like shy away, but I think when you're a weaker applicant or you have you're you're not you're you don't have as much as you think the others have, I think you go harder. You just um, do the research necessary to to get through as much as you can and not give up. Like I, I know a lot of people that just quit, you know, but that's not the answer. It's just you know, keep going. Go ahead, Miss Meadows. So it's very difficult to answer this question very succinctly and there's such a spectrum, but if there was one thing that I would want to convey was to be, be encouraged, stay encouraged, and be strategic. Um, one of the things that in my presentations, I usually give the data of what is posted on the national, for instance, for medicine, it's the AAMC. And this information is freely available to all individuals. And you see the range of GPAs and MCATs and how many individuals applied and how many individuals matriculate. And you see the whole range. In fact, one of the things I say is like a bell curve. On one end, there's 10% that have the top scores, top GPAs, and they didn't get accepted anywhere. And on the other end, you have 10% that have maybe not the most competitive GPA, a little bit under a 3.0, not the most competitive MCAT and they've been accepted to one more school. And then you have the mass in between. I like to focus on those two tail ends and say, what is the difference between those two? And it varies. One, that information, that data is just that data. And the thing that's reassuring is that it's more than just a GPA. It's more than just an exam score. There are so many things that are involved. That's why the application cycle is just that, a cycle. It was based upon those variables the application process would one be very easy for the administration and it would be over in a very short period of time frame. We're working at other elements. So that's one area to look at objectively. The other, we're creatures of comfort and we like things finite, especially those that may be more scientifically oriented. And you're entering into a process that is not concrete. What I mean is we receive thousands of applications for only so many seats. Inevitably, there is going to be equally valuable candidates and there's only one spot left. And so that is where, yes, you do have to assess what can I do to make my candidacy stronger, regardless of if there are areas that can be improved upon or if there are strengths or to pursue more. But the thing to be most mindful is that your goal is not to get into medical school, dental school, pharmacy school, that's not your goal. 
Your goal is to become a physician, a dentist, a pharmacist, a doctor. So if that is your goal and your calling, then you're willing to be strategic to enhance your application and pursue that goal until you reach that. So just know that part of it is just a matter of space and that your time will come when it comes. And in the meantime, where are you prepared to do prepare for your opportunity? Thank you. Um, so we have a couple high school seniors in the Q&A function or high school students, and they're seeking to gain some advice as they transition into the, their collegiate um, lives. What can they do both now and early on in college to um, increase their chances or you know, best prepare themselves for entry into a health profession school? Um, and would anyone like to take this one? Ms. Meadows, go for it. I'll quickly go. Identify whatever university that you're looking at or been accepted to their advising services. Do they have a designated pre-health advisor? Do they have an advising system? Seek out your support services from the get-go and start creating your network of support. That is the probably one advantageous platform that you can start as you look at and assess whether it's how you choose colleges and universities where to go to. Do they have a designated advising system? Do they have a pre-health advisor that's also a faculty member in the sciences? Or do they have a designated advising system specifically for pre-health? All of those things can kind of help you give you more insight of what kind of support you will receive in order to reach your goal, not only to be a successful candidate, but to reach your goal to be a successful health professional. So that's the one thing. Look to see if the systematic advising support, support systems that are available to you. And once you arrive on campus, make those relationships. In fact, you don't even have to wait until you arrive on campus. Reach out and make it known that you are interested and in what kind of services that they can offer to you. And that can help you make your decisions when you have multiple acceptances, which one do you choose? Completely agree. I think I checked in with the three health advisors all five times that I decided to change my major the first couple of years of college and how that would fit in with my coursework. So um, Dr. Thompson, anything to share on that topic? Um, I would second everything that Ms. Meadows has said so far and uh, maybe just add, you know, as you're going through your undergraduate experiences, probably one of the most important things is to, you know, develop your interests as organically as possible and really dive into those. Um, we in, in admissions are really good at kind of uh, weeding out the box checkers. Um, so those who just do things just for the sake of, you know, I'm pre-med, I'm pre-dental, I'm pre-whatever, I know I have to do this, check, I know I have to do that, check, and they just check the boxes. But there's no true interest there. There's no true development um, in what your passions are. Um, we can see that shines through on your application. And so go where those passions are. Now, clearly, do your prereqs, um, you know, do the things that you have to do to get to that next stage. But take the time to explore yourself and your passions and those things that really light that fire in you and do those. Um, you know, let's say, uh, you know, you really like music, uh, you're a good singer. You know, you don't have to ignore that in college just because you want to be a physician. Um, do the, you know, take choir classes or join a choir or a performance group or whatever it may be, explore those passions. That helps round out that human experience that shows us um, that you're willing to explore those other aspects of yourselves. Um, and then you're not just there to check a box to get to the next point. Um, and so really take that time to develop, use those college years. Um, I'll tell you from my own experience, I loved my college time. And if you asked me to go back and do it all over again, I would without thinking twice. Um, I loved my time in college. Uh, so you know, enjoy that time and that experience. And so, and again, just develop that, that sense of self and they follow those passions while you're kind of on that journey. So that's, that's the only thing I would add to what Ms. Meadows has said so far. Can I add something? I think, you know, to, to, um, to add to Dr. Thompson's point, um, you know, yes, organically find those, but also um, put yourself in those situations and utilize those opportunities that you have. Particularly, I could speak from my example is, you know, I, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to do undergrad on a football scholarship, but even so, I still made sure to utilize those couple weeks of the summer that I had to pick up some summer research internships. 
I knew, you know, I was kind of in the middle between, you know, organically finding what I wanted, but also kind of doing what Dr. Thompson kind of, you know, is, is alluding to, which is don't just check a box. I knew that, you know, to be uh, um, a, a competitive applicant, I had to have some research experience. I had to have some sort of, um, you know, you know, time in, in research and just in, in medicine in general prior to, you know, um, starting pharmacy school. So those are, those are the type of opportunities I, I looked for. Um, all the while, you know, yes, I was, I was engaging in other hobbies and things that really made me me. But I also knew that, that time was of the essence and I needed to use those summers while I had them. Um, I think that, you know, um, researching, you know, to, to, um, to his medals, his points, you know, just kind of, if speak to those, um, you know, to the advisors and what is it they need? What are those prerequisites? Um, once you kind of have that, you know, to, you know, reverse engineer and realize what, what do you need to get there? Whether it be, you know, volunteering, whether it be, you know, searching that uh, for those internships, I think that's really going to show, um, in your application that, that you're um, a go-getter, um, you know, where you want to go in life. Um, and you put yourself in position to, to succeed by, um, you know, by knowing what you want to do. And lastly, I think that through those experiences, you're going to really find out what you want to do. Um, you know, if, if I had realized that um, I didn't like research in, in, in those programs, then I would have probably veered elsewhere to do those things. But like being in those in environments, you know, liking to do that, that type of research, it really, you know, tapped into some passions I didn't even know I had. So um, just take those experiences, you know, and, and really, um, like I said, use those summers wisely. Uh, so we talk, a lot of people have spoken about being well-rounded um, and seeking out different opportunities and um, also not just checking the box, you know, research versus I volunteered versus this and that. Um, what advice can you give uh, our attendees regarding, do you have to check every box or do you, like, what is more meaningful um, as you're applying through the process? Uh, Dr. Jones? Yeah, um, I would always say go for checking the boxes, right? Like we want to be prepared, right? But I don't want to, you know, say do it and you get discouraged if you don't check a box, right? Or if it's impossible for you to do it, or if you miss the box, you know, trying to do it. Um, however, you know, um, like, and then kind of similar to this question that you're talking about, I just seen someone answer, ask a question, um, kind of go hand in hand with, you know, they feel like they haven't, they wasn't prepared um, by, you know, undergrad, high school or whatever. Um, like me, I'm a CPS student. I feel like I was failed by, you know, um, CPS, you know, um, I got to college and struggled. Um, and so for me, um, kind of like Dr. Thompson, it was my love for what I wanted to do that kept me going, right? Like, if you're really struggling, maybe you need to reevaluate, is this the field that you want to be in? Is this something that you really want to do? Um, because it is a service. And I knew that my service for people was, I want to make people smile, right? I want to make people happy, you know? And so I went for that, you know? And no, you don't have to be, well, you know, that you know, um, cookie cutter person. However, the passion needs to be there and it's seen by the people who um, are recruiting you, who are looking at your application. Your um, application has to have the passion. And I think that's what my application did. It had the passion. It showed, you know, that I'm ready to serve my community and, you know, those around me in the field of dentistry. So, um, you know, like Dr. Torres too, I didn't learn how to study. I didn't learn how to do anything until dental school. I got like big smacks in the face, like, man, I've been doing it this way. No, I can't do it that way. I didn't retain anything, you know? And so unfortunately, you know, like I said before, um, not to point fingers and not to get in a debate about it. I've been, I was failed by, you know, Chicago public school system, graduated with good grades, but didn't know nothing. <laughs> I found out, <laughs> um, but, you know, my passion kept me going. It took me there and I graduated, you know, I was the number one in my class in dental school, but I graduated just like the person who was number one in the class and I'm still a doctor just like them. And so I had to like take these things and fight. It was a fight. That's why I'm aggressive right now. It was a fight. <laughs> so fight for what you want, what you love, you know, and build your network. 
right? Like, um, like myself, and I'm sure everyone on this call, we know people, you know, and every person that you know, knows somebody, you know, it's a lot of, you know, what you do, how you are, but it's also who you know as well. So building, you know, your network and talking to professors, not being shy about talking to professors because you didn't perform, you know, the way you think you should perform, like they want you to come to them. Like I said before, it's that maturity level that um, makes people want to help you. They want to see you succeed when they see that you're helping yourself and that you're serious about what you're doing. It doesn't really matter on where you are. Most of the time we want to help people. We want to bring people up, you know, so um, I definitely would say just network, keep doing what you guys are doing. Like you didn't have to be here, but you hear it shows, you know, so um, yeah. Sorry if I babbled. <laughs> no, thank you. And as someone who came out of LA Unified School District, I completely understand <laughs> your struggles going into college. Um, so kind of switching gears a little bit, uh, you know, the time, the, the, the big topic of the times is, of course, COVID. Um, and that has impacted admissions and experiences for students. Um, trying to go into the health profession. So can we talk a little bit about how students can best prepare themselves in this virtual uh, time that we're in um, and set themselves apart? And also what are uh, universities and programs doing to accommodate or uh, change how they're doing things in response to COVID? Uh, we'll start with Ms. Meadows. Hi. Uh, so we've been dealing with the pandemics of COVID as well as racial injustices. It's been an amazing um, period of time. And with that, I often refer to this time also as a great awakening. So there's been a lot of new initiatives, both regarding safety, both in regards to what is medicine. I think that one of the things that was on display um, is that this field, this is, these are not individuals that are firemen or policemen where they know when they're signing up for um, this career, there is a risk in their lives and they know that up front. We saw and witnessed and observed these health professionals that because of their commitment to service that they put their lives on the line to serve others. So with that, there is, I would say a more heightened attention to why is this particular field your purpose? Why do you really want to do this? We've seen the pictures, we've seen the exhaustion, we've seen the praise and then the dismissal. Um, and we're still seeing that when it comes to wearing a mask or getting vaccinated. And so how as a future professional, where is your commitment to this? And how is it evidenced in your journey towards this? And so, all the more so of how do you show your purpose? And I think that ties into what Dr. Thompson says, like more than just checking off the boxes. Yes, have your baseline, but what needs to be shown is your purpose, your commitment. So in some ways it's been a game changer. I say it's been more elevated, but it's just more concentrated of how well you display that. There are still opportunities where you can gain experiences. Um, there have been virtual adaptation. But I would say that one major shift is really looking at the application, particularly the personal essay, the activities that display and confirm your interest towards that field. Um, and that really makes you stand out. I think that's going to be spotlighted even more so based upon what we've seen of how this has altered how we value the health professions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Thompson, would you like to add anything in particular that perhaps uh, University of Illinois, or I know you have the Urban Health Program, um, would you like to add anything about what, um, from a admissions dean standpoint, is being done? Yeah, you know, I can say when it comes to medical college admissions, at least, there has not been a single unified approach to how the response to COVID has been. So that is sort of the unfortunate piece. Um, some institutions, you know, well, some undergraduate institutions, for example, switch to some pass fail classes and classes that might not have otherwise been pass fail during the pandemic. Um, the switch to online learning as opposed to in person learning. 
um, and what those modifications may look like on a transcript and that sort of thing. Um, every medical college is sort of looking at that differently. So unfortunately, there's no single response to that across the board. Um, so in that regard, you would have to look at the schools that you might be interested in and see how they would view um, whatever changes were sort of forced upon you during the pandemic. Um, and that's sort of an unfortunate reality of the situation. Um, I can tell you from the University of Illinois College of Medicine perspective, we made um, decisions to be more inclusive rather than less um, and really took the time to evaluate each applicant based on their application in total, rather than just say, oh, well, this is a pass fail class, so I'm not going to look at it. Um, we would look at the whole application, for example, um, and really try to put everything in context of the pandemic um, and really try to, again, try, try to you know get the best sense that we can of this applicant, considering the circumstances. Um, not an easy task, to be sure, but one that we were committed to during this, um, during this cycle. Um, our hopes would be that things begin to, in some regard, normalize um, in the sense that, um, you know, the, the classes become, you know, more in person as they can and traditional types of experiences are able to resume, such as maybe volunteering or shadowing and those sorts of things, which we know in a lot of cases were put on halt. Um, we, you know, at a time where um, COVID might be um, going through a homeless shelter, for example, we would not want um, undergraduate students to be putting themselves at risk, particularly in the early days of the pandemic when we were not as sure as we are now about what level of personal protective equipment was necessary and those sorts of things. Um, so we try to take all of that into consideration um, in understanding an applicant uh, for themselves. And again, we hope there is some degree of normalization as we move forward with vaccination and that sort of thing as we've gotten a better understanding of uh, patterns of spread of the disease and that, those sorts of things. Um, so we're hopeful for a, a more normalized future, hopefully pretty soon. Um, but at the same time, um, our commitment is again to consider each applicant for the applicant they are, not just based on a single metric or a single experience and that sort of thing. Um, but I cannot, I cannot really comment on how other colleges of medicine are doing this because there is certainly a plurality in, uh, in what colleges of medicine are looking for. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so I would like to add in a couple of students um, to our discussion. Uh, we have students from medicine, uh, dentistry, and pharmacy. So I'd like to bring, we're planning to bring them on board here shortly um, and we'll have them introduce ourselves, themselves, excuse me. Um, we're also gonna be having a poll here shortly um, so keep an eye out for that for the attendees. Um, it looks like they may be starting to come in. Okay, I'm going to launch a poll. Uh, Dr. Matthews, did you want to introduce the poll as I'm launching? Sure. Thank you so much, everyone, tonight. We've had such a great audience this evening and we wanted to give everyone an opportunity to be entered into a raffle tonight. One of our very good friends who's actually part of a panel that we're also co-hosting later this week, Dr. Sunny Nakai, who is an admissions dean out in California. She has written an amazing book called Pre-Med Prep. And we're raffling off a couple copies of her book. So if you are interested, please click yes in this current poll and you'll be entered and we'll be randomly uh, selecting three uh, students this evening. And I'll be reaching out personally to uh, get your address to send you the copy of the book if you are a winner. So thank you so much for joining this evening. Thank you. We have, um, I see a couple of numbers still coming through. We're going to give you about uh, five more seconds and then I'm going to close the poll. Okay, I'm going to get ready to close the poll and then we have our um, professional students who have joined us. And we're going to have them go ahead and introduce themselves. Um, Dr. Jackson, I'll let you take over. Thank you. Uh, let's go ahead and start with Delashawn Fisher. Hello, everyone. My name is Delashawn Fisher. 
um, or if you're a pharmacy student, I see. Uh, just uh, just a little bit about me. I'm originally from Chicago, born and raised. So uh, I can speak to the CPS school system that uh, was spoke about earlier. And yeah, I've been with you know UIC. I came up through Malcolm X uh, through undergrad and took the took the opportunity to go into pharmacy career after working as a farm tech for a few years. Great. Perfect. Um, and Courtney Akande. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Courtney. I am currently a second year dental student um, at the College of Dentistry at uh, UIC. Um, I'm also originally from Chicago. So I've also gone through the CPS system. Um, and uh, yeah, I went to uh, UIUC um, for undergrad. Um, and uh, I then went to NYU um, to um, receive my master's in public health. So I went from sciences and undergrad to public health and grad school, which for me kind of tied everything together in terms of oral health and uh, public health and dentistry. And that for me kind of developed my love for um, uh, the two and intertwining them. Um, but yeah. Thank you. And lastly, Alexis Hall. Hi everyone, my name is Alexis Hall. Um, I went to DePaul University for undergrad. Um, then I worked for about a year and a half for Johnson & Johnson. I graduated with a BS in biochem. So originally I thought I wanted to be like a medicinal chemist. Um, then I moved to Washington DC. I went to George Washington University to obtain my master's and epidemiology biostats. And at the time I felt like I finally found my career path as a clinical epidemiologist. And when I was working for NIH, um, I realized that medicine was missing and I should go back to my first dream. So I uh, applied to med school and then I pursued medicine. Um, and I was out of school for about seven years. So I um, did the, I was invited to do the post back at uh, UIC and so um, uh, Chicago's home and again product of CPS so I came home and I'm here in my third year at the University of Illinois Chicago. Thank you. So since we have the students on um, if you guys wouldn't mind shortly telling us a little example of what the day in the life of your current experiences are is um, whether that's right now with COVID or you know even pre COVID since hopefully we'll go back to to that lifestyle soon enough. Um, sorry, Courtney. Sure. Um, so I can kind of speak to both. Um, so pre-COVID um, for dental school, we had classes from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Uh, five days a week, um, which was a mix of having um, actual uh, uh, classroom learning um, from professors. And then we'd have a mix of uh, lab work um, and clinical work, practicing on mannequins for starting off with like wax ups and um, getting the proper shapes and contours, et cetera, of how teeth are initially, just like in the beginning. Um, and then um, clinical work from learning how to prepare um, restorations for uh, both with composite and um, amalgam. Uh, so a large mix there, they were really long days. Um, but now um, after COVID, uh, we do a lot of that didactic learning um, at home. We do are going through our lectures, we watch pre-recorded lectures and on our own time and it, takes a lot of you know regimented steps to be able to keep up with all of that and a lot of quizzes and things like that um but we still do go in now they're starting to um with the restrictions being a little loosened up having more time in school to work on lab activities and clinical activities um but a lot less time than before but yeah overall that's how it's looking right now 
Great, thank you. Alexis or Delashawn, anything additional or different necessarily than the dental experience that you'd like to share? Um, I can speak for medicine. Uh, prior to COVID, I was primarily in my, I was studying for step one actually. So that time was spent like 13 hours a day studying. Um, but prior to that, I was in preclinical years. So for like the first year and a half, I uh, had a mixture of going to class for TBLs or listening to recorded lectures or basically using whatever resources I needed to sort of study. Um, then after uh, COVID was still ongoing, but the university allowed us to start up our clinical rotations. So although they were abbreviated as in like some were uh, went from eight weeks to now six weeks. Um, pretty much, it honestly depends on what rotation you're on. Like uh, today actually is my first day of OBGYN. So um, the hours are pretty long, pretty rough. Uh, it could be anywhere from 5.36 a.m. to uh, 6, 7 o'clock at night. Um, I just finished psych. And so psych was more of your standard, like eight to four sometimes eight to noon. Um, surgery, you know, I was there sometimes 4.30 in the morning and I left at six, seven o'clock at night. So it honestly varies, but um, you're there, you're, you're in some sort of clinic uh, anywhere from five to six days a week. And that's, that's pretty much, and then you're studying in between. So for me, uh, the first three years of pharmacy school, you primarily do didactic training. So, um, you know, luckily I was able to, you know, actually do most of that on campus. And that would kind of consist of, you know, normally typically four days a week, you'd be on campus uh, around, you know, 8.30 to 4, 4 p.m., uh, give or take in class and uh, you spend one day a week normally at different sites with pharmacies normally a hospital uh, community sites or kind of um, you know different areas like that so i'm currently in my last year and that's where we do all of our clinical experiences so we work in this different disciplines with pharmacy so the core ones you know, consists of a hospital, a medicine rotation, a community rotation, and um, keep blanking on the fourth one. And then you also get three electives and I chose ambulatory care. That's also a course so I, I did ambulatory care for the uh, advanced elective. And I also did administrative and um, academia so you know you basically have a uh, eight or six week rotations and you get one rotation off so you kind of go through all those different disciplines during that time oh, thank you um so we're nearing the end of our program. Um, it's about five minutes before we're going to uh, jump off. I wanted to give anyone an opportunity to, be, to briefly give any last minute um, tidbits or advice. Um, so if anyone has any last minute things they'd like to share, just go ahead and raise your hand and uh, Dr. Jones. Yeah, I just really want to say like, you know, nobody can stop us, but us, right? Like, um, so I'm just, you know, skimming through some of the questions and a lot of things seem to be internal <laughs> thoughts. Like they're not like said, it's like, this is what it, I feel, you know, and that's okay. You know, you should definitely have a feel, you know, for it all. You should definitely be emotionally attached. But at the end of the day, it's all about, the facts like there are people that get in dental school who are not qualified there are some that get I mean medical school too that are not like so-called qualified and there are some who are you know and so uh, we definitely want to make sure that we are you know um, not giving up I think that's the biggest thing when you give up you lose the fat lady sings right not over to the fat ladies so um, definitely keep keep going don't stop obstacles will come it won't be easy. Nothing worth it is easy. Okay. 
so we can't expect this to be a smooth sailing road. So um, if you don't, if you apply once and you don't get it, apply again. You know, um, nothing's wrong with that. No one's looking at your track record of like how many times you apply. They don't care. They don't have time. They want to see the passion that you have, what it takes to be a medical provider here in the United States. As a, so that's all I had to. Yeah, to add to that from the student perspective, definitely, you know, like throughout my time, there's always times where you doubt yourself. You doubt, I doubt myself sometimes to see if, to, um, you know, kind of believing that I could get in. And once I got in, it was like, can I do this? And then, you know, kind of coming on the other side, it's like, oh, you know, now I'm through school. Like, what does that look like for, on the other side for me? Like, can I, you know, be a, a good pharmacist? So there's always going to be like that fear of uncertainty, but if you're committed to, you know, knowing that this is what you want to do then just pursue it anyways and do whatever it takes. Thank you. I think that's a really great note to end on. Um, on behalf of the Tour for Diversity and on behalf of the University of Illinois Urban Health Program, I'd like to thank all of our attendees for joining us this evening. Um, we are, we have plenty of other workshops and information. So feel free to reach out to either organization um, if you're looking for more. And I hope that everyone has a lovely evening.